Good evening and welcome to tonight's online event from the British Library. My name is Polly Russell and I'm co-curator of the exhibition Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce this evening's conversation with none other than Gloria Steinem, one of the most influential campaigners for women's rights. Gloria will be talking live to Zainab Badawi about her remarkable and very much unfinished work as a social justice activist, journalist and author. The many issues that she has tackled since the 1960s are central to unfinished business, which is temporarily closed, but the moment it's open, please do come back and visit or you can join us for regular online events which continue in a week's time with an evening with the one and only Dolly Parton. I'll now hand over to our host, Zainab Badawi, one of our most respected broadcasters and journalists and also chair of the Royal African Society. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much indeed to Polly at the uh, British Library there for that very nice introduction. I am Zainab Badawi and wow. I am so glad to be with the wonderful Gloria Steinem. Hello to you there, Gloria, the United States. And I'm so glad we be with you. <laughs> so, yeah, it's great. At, at this time, though, it's across the electronic airwaves, across the Atlantic Ocean, not like last time when we met in person a couple of years ago in the south mm. of France. It really is great to be part of this um, event and also welcome to all the audiences um, in British libraries from all over the country who are part of that living knowledge um, network. But of course, welcome to all of you who are listening to this conversation and you are part of it too, because I'm going to kick off with some chat with Gloria, but I want you at any time to go to the tab, the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and just tap in some questions, keep them quite brief if you can and um, I'll do my best to get through as many um, as I can. And also, um, if you go to your screen at the top, you'll see that there's a, a form and you can give your feedback, but also you can also use that to buy some of Gloria's books, which are for sale. And wait for this, the first 50 books are going to have a book plate that's signed by Gloria herself. And so some of Gloria's books are going to be um, you know, on, on sale throughout this um, this event. Um, Gloria, you don't really need much of an introduction, but I may as well just remind people about your long and illustrious career because you've done so many things, many good things, Gloria. Um, you were founder of New York and Ms. Magazines. You're the author of several books, My Life on the Road, Moving Beyond Words, and your wonderful new book that's just come out, The Truth Will Set You Free, but first it will piss you off. Um, you co-founded the National Women's Political Caucus, the Free to Be Foundation, the Women's Media Center in the United States, um, and also you've worked with Direct Impact Africa. That's what I love about your work, Gloria, because um, it's relevant across continents. Africa, you've lived in India, and you've won many awards along the way, too many to list, but I will mention the Emmy that you won in the early 90s for your TV documentary, about child abuse and the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama in 2013. And most recently, Gloria, you produced a series of documentaries, eight of them on violence against women around the world. Gloria, how relevant is that? Because mm. we know that COVID-19 has brought so much death and destruction and terrible things in its wake and it's still wreaking havoc. But one of the things that it has done, it's more than anecdotal evidence now, is that uh, we've seen a, an increase in domestic violence against women. We've seen various trends in women's lives emerge as a result of COVID-19. We know they're more likely to lose their jobs. We know they're the ones who are taking a, a disproportionate burden of the care of children, older relatives. Um, they're losing their jobs more than men because they're often part-time vulnerable jobs in the service sector and they're not getting the new jobs which are being created the technology ones because women don't work in the stem subjects as much so just give us your reflections all in all in in what you think covid19 tells us about the state of women today and the unfinished business i think you've just done an excellent job of surveying what the problems are I mean, to have this kind of pandemic reveals 
the fissures in the systems that we've been living in, whether it is the problems with hospitals, the unevenness of, of medical care, especially in this country, when we don't have the same kind of supposition of universal, universal health care that you have in many European countries. Um, it, 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 is, it reveals injustice. And I hope that we take this to heart and understand what we must do even after the pandemic is over and look at these injustices and these imbalances in power and not uh, smooth over them ever again. It's, it's as if the pandemic is an enormous truth teller about the, pro the uh, prejudices that come with gender and race uh, and, and class and exacerbate all of these, all of these things. Um, so I hope, I hope it's a lesson. I hope we are learning. But Gloria, we've also heard a lot said about how women leaders have had a better fight, as it were, against COVID-19. You know, you've got people like Sanna Marine, the Prime Minister in Finland, Angela Merkel in Germany, the Prime Minister of Taiwan, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. And we've seen that they have managed to keep levels of infection and deaths lower. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of them say, look, that's nothing to do with my gender or whatever. It's just I'm pursuing the right policies. But um, do you think that perhaps it has put the spotlight in a more favorable way on just mm. what women can do when they're in positions of leadership. No, yes, that's true too. And we see it here in states that have women governors and have fared better. And I don't think it's something that comes physiologically with being a female. It's something that comes with our cultural experience because our model of leadership is much more likely to be uh, centered in the family than in the military, say. You know, so it's not as hierarchical, it's more inclusive, and consciously or unconsciously, I think we take this family model and consider the uh, welfare of the group as a whole. And, but it is not magic, men can learn this, many men know how to do this too, so I just hope that um, the example of the pandemic, plus the example, as you point out, of women leaders around the country, makes it clear that women are not just people who are trying to make it up in the existing system. We are trying to transform the system as it is and teach what we know. Yeah, it's very interesting because I was listening to Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank, uh, of course, a very you know, renowned um, French woman who's done many things. And, and she said that in her many decades of working in public life, that she thinks that women make better leaders because they combine emotional and rational intelligence. And that it's when you have those two working together that you have more effective leadership. And I wonder if you could comment on that, but also give us your views on the fact that we are now going to see on January the 20th, the first female vice president in the United States, very powerful position she's going to have, Senator Kamala Harris. Um, and um, what, what do you really make of that? Well, I can't believe it's taken so long. <laughs> I mean, uh, in 1972, Shirley Chisholm, uh, perhaps a name people know because she was a first in so many ways, uh, as an African-American woman in politics in this country. But she declared for the presidency in 1972, she was only on the ballot in 14 states, but she, person, she kind of took the white male only sign off the White House door. Uh, and <laughs> it's taken a long time for uh, even a vice president uh, like Kamala Harris, a very, very, uh, very, not just qualified, but um, uh, inspirational leader, you know, just to be in her presence 
it, it, whatever her position is, is, is transforming. So I hope that we are finally beginning to choose leadership from the whole population, not just from half of it or less than half of it. It's crazy when you think of it. It's absolutely crazy. <laughs> so maybe in my lifetime, we'll see, we'll see a little sanity. It's interesting you raise um, the, the case of Shirley Chisholm in 1972, an election, of course, which um, she didn't get the Democratic Party nomination, as you said, and it was an election that Richard Nixon won. But interesting enough, Shirley Chisholm said that she encountered more prejudice as a result of being a woman because of her gender rather than the colour of her skin. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wonder, because that's always been, of course, a conversation that runs at the heart of the women's movement. You've heard, um, you know, a lot of African-American women, um, Asian-American women saying, you know, what is the greater obstacle for us? Is it the colour of our skin, where we ally ourselves with our um, fellow, you know, with our male, black males and Asian males and so on? Or do we ally ourselves with our white sisters? So, I mean, that's what Shirley thought. It was gender trumped color. But do, do you? Well, that, that was her experience because yeah. when she was coming up in the political systems in Brooklyn, it had a black male hierarchy. Uh, so it, all, it had a hierarchy regardless of race, but those particular black men were not receptive to her when she was in the state legislature or when, you know, when she was coming up altogether. So she was reporting on her experience. But I don't think we have to have a competition of tears. <laughs> tears are tears, right? So whatever it is that we are encountering, uh, that is, is what is important. But it's not to state which is more important, sexism or racism, because obviously they're both crucial, and I'm, they both uh, reinforce each other. I mean, in order to maintain any visible racial difference, you have to control who marries whom and who has children with whom, you know. So uh, these, these evils are intertwined, and we can only uproot them together. So you've got this new book out that's just come out, uh, which I've read, which is lovely, called The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Piss You Off. And um, I, I mean, you, you talk at the beginning about, um, I, I think the sayings from the Bible, isn't it? The idea that, that Jesus Christ said that um, um, the truth will set you free. And, and the idea is that knowledge is the thing that will set you free. I mean, how far have you been guided by this in your life's work and your aims? Because after all, this is an event which is one for the British Library. Well, I just want to say what a huge role libraries made in my life and continue to make. They are so precious. Uh, when I was uh, a teenager in kind of a not too great situation, in the, the wrong part of Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> it was the library that was the resource for me. And I was not very um, intelligent about the way I used it. I, 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 I read books as they came up on the shelves. You know, I would read them kind of alphabetically. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, it allowed me to to enter worlds and to have a kind of comfort level. So just the importance of libraries is something we should uh, remember on the upside as because we see that dictators through history have tried to destroy libraries and destroy that knowledge. Actually, there's a wonderful uh, old movie that I recommend if people are now, COVID-wise into old movies. It's called Fahrenheit 451, Truffaut. Did you see that ever? No, I haven't, but I shall. <laughs> it's because it is about the importance of books and they live in a society in which books are being burned. And so uh, people, each person takes it upon himself or herself to memorize a book, a complete book so that books become human 
um, even after the fire of 451. It's just very, very moving. Yeah, yeah, I should look at that. Whenever I think of libraries, I remember a professor who once talked to me who said he didn't like Christmas Day very much because it was the only day of the year that his wife would not allow him to go to the library. He was such a dedicated academic. <laughs> he hated it. So there you are, people from the British Library will be very happy you've had that re-endorsement of libraries um, by <laughs> Gloria Steinem. Gloria, you talk in your book about how families um, are chosen, uh, families born and chosen, you say. Um, you say chosen families of people who share and support our hopes and our interests and that your birth families are often patriarchal. And we hear so many women in the women's rights movement talking about how patriarchy, what, you know, everywhere in the world is the kind of the source of the, the, the constraints on women. Were you yourself brought up in a very patriarchal family? Uh, no, I wasn't. Uh, I was very lucky in that regard because my father was a kind of, of, I don't know how to explain him. He had two points of pride. He never wore a hat and he never had a job, <laughs> by which he meant he always worked for himself. So he was at home and around uh, at least as much as my mother was. I was his buddy, his friend. He took me with him to when he was buying and selling antiques and I would, because I would wrap and unwrap them in newspaper, you know, I mean, I, I was lucky to have that kind of um, companionship with, with both of my parents, but it, the form of most cultures in which men have been earning the money and have been away from home and women have been consigned uh, to childcare much more than men, means that that we grow up in a the beginning of a hierarchy that's very deep. We come to think men can't be as loving and nurturing as women, which is a libel on men. And we come to think women are not as rational or able to be powerful in the world outside the home, which is a libel on women. But you, you talk about, you, in this book and also your other writings, about how women are valued for their reproductive capacity. I mean, that's never going to change, is it, really? Because women do have the children. Um, True, but, yeah. but the, the goal is that we can decide when and whether to have children. Yes, we have wombs, and that's not going to change, <laughs> probably although there have been a few children born outside of, you know, with fertilized eggs, but, but that is you know, far, far in the future as a subject of science fiction. Um, but the point is that we get to decide the fate and use of our own bodies. We get to decide when and whether we have children. And patriarchy is the contrary. Patriarchy says no, Men decide, women do not decide. So uprooting that system is fundamental to women just simply controlling the fate of our own physical selves. But could you also have a situation where perhaps more emphasis is put on reproductive work rather than just productive work, which is a more of a kind of male definition of what we see as being work to be valued? Well, it is certainly uh, w women's, you know, that we spend nine months gestating a child and a certain amount of time taking care of it, that should be valued and supported because it is a, clearly a crucial function in society. And instead, it's often been compelled instead of uh, valued and supported. So we're getting some questions in which I'm going to uh, uh, put to you because um, uh, just to put some context to this as well, you, you were involved in the anti-Vietnam um, movement and you've written and spoken so much about how women were not treated as equals by many of the men and this is what pissed off 
a lot of women, hence the title, um, part of the title of your book. And there's a question from Barbara Holtman here, which is, men in power still speak so dismissively of women. Do you think that can change? And what should we be doing more of to make it happen? Uh, well, it, it shouldn't be our burden to educate men in power. It should be, it's probably more practical to replace them than to educate them. But, uh, so I would say replacing them is, comes num is number one, but educating them is certainly worthwhile too. And we can do that in all kinds of ways. We can, you know, we used to uh, occupy men's offices, for instance, and just not leave. You know, a dozen women would just occupy the office of some decision maker and just stay there and talk to him. Uh, it, it may not have to be so forcible. We, the leader may be willing to make a series of appointments, but however it is, we should at least be talking to the men who are making decisions in our lives. And I mean, again, the importance of getting men as allies to help effect change is a very important one. So you've just said that it's very important to educate men. So I'll put that with another question we've had from Liz Mason here, which is, I'll preface it with this. Could you re-educate somebody like Donald Trump, for instance, because Liz Mason asks, how much damage has Donald Trump done in terms of sexism and racism? Mm -hmm. I would say, as someone who comes from New York and has observed Donald Trump from the beginning, that he is hopeless because uh, he cannot empathize. He is a, as, as, as many uh, psychiatrists wrote, I think 200 or so psychiatrists wrote when he was first elected, he has narcissistic personality disorder. It is, he is a lit, one of the few or some people who are just incapable of understanding what someone else is feeling. So, you know, we in New York, where he came from, tried to tell that to the rest of the country, but uh, they had to learn it the hard way. So you were talking there about, also we were talking about getting men on board and, and so on. A, a question from Angela here, which is, what is your definition or defining characteristics of a male feminist? You know, I, I just think it's, it's uh, the thing of which Trump is incapable, which is empathy. <laughs> it's it's a man who can imagine uh, the world if, as if they were exactly the same person with all the same humor and hopes and dreams and they were born female. What would their lives be like? And if they can imagine that, then they can, they can imagine uh, what is helpful to do in society in order to free the full human range of human talents of both women and men. Yeah. We're getting some lots of questions coming in here. I'm going to carry on chatting with you in between the questions, but I've got one here from a mother and daughter. So Emma Barham says her seven-year-old daughter, Florence, has a question for you. Gosh, seven years of age. Adrian. That's wonderful. Thank Adrian you. reason, isn't it? She <laughs> said, how did you get involved in women's rights in the first place, so how and, and, and why? Uh, well, because I'm an old person, I didn't get involved uh, as early as I otherwise would have because there was no women's movement when I was growing up. It, I, it just didn't exist. So I, it wasn't until after I had graduated from college and lived in India for two years, where there was a uh, national important women's movement that was part of the independence movement, that I realized there could be such a thing as a women's movement. But fortunately, you at seven are growing up <laughs> in a time when there's very clear um, women's movement and a girls' movement, girls' rights, you know, is, I mean, uh, pe people, girls write to me the most wonderful letters uh, saying things like, uh, we are 
organizing to get uh, all to be able to use all of the playground. The boys, otherwise, you know, we can just play jacks in the corner. The boys get the playground. I mean, that's great. You know, <laughs> that's the beginning of, of a revolutionary. Gloria, I know that you've written uh, about how some of the women you work with, you say, are younger than your blue jeans. <laughs> yes. Yeah, age segregation. That is quite shocking, right? <laughs> I think I'm agree with you there. But anyway, age segregation is not a good idea, you say, because you, you, you say how young people bring you the gift of anger. And I've often, you know, looked at the impatience of youth and, and you know they give you you also say they give you that gift of hope and optimism but have you lost that kind of indignation of youth as you've got older have you softened your your fight in any way or have you still got that indignation of youth um i think i don't have it in the same way you know because i understand just from the number of years that I, you know, I've been alive, that it's possible it will take a long time. And so I'm very energized by the younger women who are mad as hell right now. You know, <laughs> so I think we need each other because I can be helpful in pointing out long-term tactics and they supply the anger and the energy that we all need. So I said that it was a mother and daughter question. So um, Emma's question to you is, what's your best advice as to how to convince male leaders why gender equality is an issue worthy of attention? She says so many male colleagues support gender equality, except when it comes to their own actions or rather not put views into practice. So what's your advice about convincing? Well, um... You know, I, I, I trust each woman to figure out tactics that are appropriate to, to, the, to the situation. Um, but uh, any, any, any way that we can produce empathy so that that leader can understand uh, what his life would be like if he had been born female and therefore... Uh, begin to remedy whatever the, the barriers are. And, you know, we've done this in all kinds of ways. I mean, we once uh, occupied the office of the, uh, because for a long time here, women's magazines were edited by men. Uh, and earlier in the movement, a group of women just occupied his office and refused to let him out and uh, talk to him for hours. And he was actually quite fearful <laughs> of this. So it, it, it you know, it was, it was uh, quite a uh, transforming event in his life. So, so, you know, that's extreme, just physically occupying somebody's office, locking the door and talking to him for a whole day. Uh, but, it's, uh, but it's possible. Right. And, you know, sometimes men who have daughters are uh, may be more empathetic because they want the best for their daughters and that becomes a bridge so i mean you've been a great um advocate and participant yourself in street activism and and you know you've talked about the power of the slogan i mean it's slightly related to emma's question in the sense that sometimes people will rally behind a slogan and say yeah 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 i you know i stand for that i believe in women's equality but then their actions actually don't support um you know what they say but i mean the power of the slogan is it's it's quite important we've seen two very successful examples set up by women in the last year or so, which is BLM, Black Lives Matter, set up by mm -hmm. women. And also, of course, the Me Too campaign, which was init initially coined by Tarana Burke, the African-American activist who actually said Me Too uh, in order to put a, 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 you know, a focus on the sexual abuse of young women within the African-American community. And then it was taken up by Hollywood and you had Time's Up and so on. So, these were slogans, but they brought real action and change behind them. How 
much change do you think they've really brought? I, you know, it's, these kinds of slogans are the poetry of everyday life. You know, they uh, express uh, the f feelings of, of large numbers of people in a very short, quotable way. And that is very valuable. It is a kind of poetry, activist poetry. So to say Black Lives Matter is very important. And in fact, the, uh, the book that we are talking about, my book, was originally called uh, America as if everyone mattered. That was its title. But once Black Lives Matter came along, I dispensed with the main title and just used the subtitle because I thought, you know, that that slogan belongs to Black Lives Matter. Yeah, interesting. But I mean, you know, that importance of, of slogans having a unifying um, effect and also, you know, people can rally around idea slogans like Me Too. We've seen Me Too campaigns in Egypt, in India, just, you know, really all over the world. Um, do you think that it really was a turning point, not only for women in the United States, the Me Too campaign, that it really, you, you know, you've talked about how evil is often only uh, detected in hindsight. So we've now got Harvey Weinstein behind bars. You know, there were many people who were his associates and friends and so on and so forth. Um, but do you think that this has brought about fundamental change? In, in I, I, unfinished business. I think so, but it also was part of a continuum because right. in order for me too to be powerful, you had to know what it meant, right? So it started out in my life at least with uh, women in on a university campus who were, this was in the early 1970s, who were trying to describe what happened to them in their summer jobs. And they invented the term sexual harassment. We then at Ms. Magazine did a cover story on sexual harassment, which I have to say was put out of the supermarkets as too controversial to be on the newsstands <laughs> because it was on the cover with an illustration, even though we did it with puppets so that it wouldn't be too shocking. But anyway, um, then sexual harassment became part of, of uh, <clears throat> sex discrimination law uh, and, and uh, several cases, <clears throat> so, excuse me, <clears throat> so, were brought by <clears throat> women and, and, uh, and won. And so it's been a long journey right. for people to understand sex, that sexual, what sexual harassment is and therefore to give me too meaning. Right, yeah, and I know you, one of the quotes in your books is, when unique voices are united in a common <clears> cause, <throat> they make history. And I think a lot of people do say that. It related to a question we're getting from Melanie David here, which goes back to what we talked about, about you know greater domestic violence because women in lockdown can't escape abusive partners and so on. And she <clears> asked, how can we do something about domestic violence? I don't know what you would say to Melanie. Well, it, it, first of all, we can, we can name uh, men's violence because domestic violence sounds as if nobody's doing it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and to talk about the women who are survivors of domestic violence doesn't name the perpetrator. So we can at least begin by naming the violence of men, the idea that some men have that they have a right to dominate, especially in the household, because that's, that's the source of patriarchy in many cases. We can at least name it uh, and attribute it to the wrongdoer instead of behaving, instead of only naming the victim. Right. And I know that, as I said, you've done work in India and Africa and so on. So a question here from Kate Beasley, <clears throat> which asks, uh, does Western feminism run the risk of operating in a bubble, forgetting that the majority of the world's women have fundamental struggles? Mm -hmm. so do you think that Western feminism 
has a bit of a kind of blinkered attitude to what we define as women's rights? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure because it depends wh where we are looking. In my life, I mean, I learned feminism from living in India uh, and seeing the women's movement there. So it was always clear to me that women in other countries were more advanced in the sense of organizing often than we were in the United States. But, but it probably depends what our individual experiences are. I think that we are now greatly aided by the media and by the internet so that we can be in touch with each other and, um, and aid each other. Um, so, you know, some, sometimes we can publicize in one country the outrages and the injustices in another country with more than that country is willing to do it themselves. So it's, it's very important that we are in touch with each other. And there are groups like Equality Now and so many, so many groups that are global in that way, and we need more. Mm. And so you don't think that there's any kind of variation it, to take into account cultural practices and so on. You believe that there are <laughs> universal values that govern what we define as women's rights, regardless of where you are in the world? Well, it, 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 it depends on the, the women who are on the ground. What they think and what they want is what we need to support. It is the women who are experiencing the problem who are the experts in the problem. Right, very good, thank you for that. And by the way, Emma Barham, who had the daughter Florence says, thank you Gloria for answering my question and Florence's bedtime for Flo now after a lot of squealing, we were both thrilled. So there you <laughs> are, I'm sure that you're <laughs> You're addressing Florence is imprinted on her mind, and indeed she's going to do something fantastic in the realm of women's rights in the future. When well, she... Florence, Florence is now Im imprinted on mine as the future, and I'm so That's grateful. The future. Um, she's certainly younger than your blue jeans, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, I don't know whether you've been following the um, controversy here about the Mary Wollstonecraft statue, the 17th century British philosopher, because Cheryl Burton asks, assuming that you've heard about and seen the pictures of her statue and the debates it's provoked, what do you think of it and how it's divided feminist opinion? So it was a skull. Well, well, I, yes, I have. But, you know, I've seen the photograph and I and we ourselves had various controversies, too, about uh, statues in Central Park, <laughs> which we only partly saw. But I'm not sure I understand this one. So can you explain to me? Well, what the, the, the controversy was she was um, depicted a rather small statue, but she was naked with very pert breasts and a great deal of um, hair around her pubis. And um, a, lot of, a lot of women and men objected to the fact that you had this woman who was really ahead of her time, very iconoclastic in standing up for, you know, women's rights, a feminist as it were, and she had to be depicted naked. And the idea was that you wouldn't have, you know, a, a man with no clothes on. Mm. Um, so well, that, is, that is ridiculous. I think, I think that <clears throat> unless people are willing to take the clothes off the male statues <laughs> and have them, have them recreated nude, that I think uh, equality demands that she be as clothed as the male statues are. All right, okay, we might. That's good, thank you for answering that question from Shirley. So um, a question here from Catherine War. How do we ensure that these feminist conversations that we're having now are not limited to typically middle-class spaces such as this. How do we make these campaigns and conversations accessible and useful for all women? We kind of touched on that, but you can expand on it a bit. Mm. Mm. Well, speaking for my experience in this country, uh, black women have always been in advance uh, in terms of feminism more likely to be activists than white women. And this remains true if you look at the results of the last uh, presidential election, for instance, 
96% uh, of, that is the election of Trump, 96% of black women voted against Trump and 51% of white women voted for Trump. So it has always been true that women of color have been more um, understanding of the issues of equality and more in the leadership of the women's movement than white women, just because of situations. I mean, white women are more likely to be dependent on, on their husband's incomes and therefore be voting their husband's interests rather than the interests of women as a group. Uh, it, it just, I mean, we just need to look at the, at the real situation and, uh, and the issues and, and account for um, the fact, for who is in leadership of those issues. Mm. And there are, of course, I mean, yes, this conversation perhaps maybe in this kind of middle class space as um, Catherine suggests, but um, there are conversations about women's rights and there are many feminists all over the world, you know, continent of Asia, Africa, and um, mm. in their own languages, they'll be having similar conversations, I know, because I've experienced them. We've seen, you know, women's rights activists in the Arab world and so on. Sadly, some of them do suffer for uh, voicing their opinions, but I, I, I'm sure that um, we do have those conversations all over um, the world. You, you mentioned race there and so on, and you, I wonder if you would um, perhaps give us your view on on legislation and just how influential it is. So we've had the you know, Equality Act in so many countries in the world and you know, pay disparities shouldn't exist and so on. But you, you talk in, in, in one of your books um, about how, for example, the civil war in the United States may have eliminated slavery, but it didn't really challenge the power of racism. So you can have a whole raft of equality legislation in favor of women, but it doesn't actually address the problem of you know, discrimination against women or change mindsets, does it? Well, it, it you know, it depends. Uh, I mean, part of the fun and excitement of a social justice movement is inventing ways to move forward. Um, and some of them are quite simple. I mean, when we're starting a group uh, to address a certain problem, we should wait until we have in the room the people who are experiencing the problem. I mean, people, whoever is experiencing something is more expert in it than the experts. So if we just wait to, to start a group until it looks like the people who are experiencing the problem we are addressing will be much more effective. Right, thank you. We're getting more questions in. Again, um, I think it's no secret that you you are you support the right to abortion, and I think you have a quote in your book, one your, your book, which says, "If men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament." Yes, <laughs> which was which was yeah. not mine. It was said by a wonderful old woman taxi driver. <laughs> yeah, who said that? Right. A standout quote in, in your book, which is a, a wonderful book. I do recommend it to everybody. Sort of your reflections on life and love and and all the rest of it. But this question um, from um, somebody, actually the name is not, yeah, a question from Angela. She says, can you be a feminist and be pro-life? Yes, absolutely. It's just, the principle is just that you don't make decisions for other women. So you can be pro-life for yourself and you wouldn't dream ever of having an abortion. and. I and others support you in that. It's only a, becomes a problem if you are dictating to another woman what her decision should be either way. All right, so, yeah. yeah, so certainly feminism includes women who are pro-life for themselves. But let me, a, a more difficult question is, can you be a feminist and be pro, it, can you be opposed to pro-choice, you're not pro-choice, can you still be a feminist if you're not pro-choice? Well, I, I think you can if you're not pro-choice for yourself, 
but I don't think you can dictate to other women. I right. think that, that the basis of feminism is women's power first over our own bodies and then our equal power in society. Right. Um, oh, you're getting difficult questions here. We've had a lot of controversy um, in the United Kingdom, particularly with J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author, when she talked about um, when somebody mentioned people who menstruate and she said there's a word for that surely, WOMAD or whatever, you know, uh, kind of suggesting that actually there's a word women for people who menstruate. And so there's a question here from Diane Strettle, which says, can a transgender female truly understand women's issues and speak politically for other women? Mm -hmm. You know, I <clears throat> I don't think I can answer that because it depends on the individual that we're talking about. But I think feminism includes everybody who identifies as a female. So even if a person was not born female, but now identifies and lives as a female, then certainly feminism includes them. I had a conversation recently with another eminent American feminist the uh, lawyer, Gloria Allred, and I asked her about this question. And, um, you know, she's done a lot, as you know, in, in the field of um, rights for LGBTQ. And um, she felt that transgender women should be supported mm -hmm. as much as one can, because there's a lot of space out there which is um, not favorable to them. And she felt that anything which would open up that space was not something that she would welcome. So that's what Gloria already, another Gloria, another glorious. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think that we, that we each have a right to determine who we are. And if a person who is not born female identifies as female, then she is included. Right, okay, thank you. So um, getting more questions here. Um, so, oh, just a question from, okay, oh, this is about the statue that we had. Just to say, say the statue is entitled for Mary Wollstonecraft. The artist said the female figure is not Mary, that's the sculptor. It is every woman and the lack of clothes makes her timeless. Clothes would have placed her into a historical context. I couldn't help comment. It's important to understand that in order to understand the statue. So just a, a qualification mm. there from Kelly Stevens. Thank you, Kelly, for that. Um, so another question here, Gloria, from Rachel Fenn. Hi, Gloria. I'm a teacher, and while I see a lot of my students getting angry about the lack of equality in our society and wanting to bring, out cha bring about change, many, including female students, don't want to call themselves feminists as they believe feminists hate men. Long question, bear with me. Thank you, Rachel. Why do you think calling yourself a feminist is still so problematic for people? And how can we reclaim the term feminism as a positive force to bring about equality for everyone in the 21st century? There you are. Well, when in the middle of this discussion, I usually just send people to the dictionary <laughs> <laughs> because, if you see, if you look up the word feminist, it has nothing to do with hating men. It has just, it has to do with uh, equality for women. So I think uh, the dictionary should rule. And the kind of notion that uh, of man hating just came from men who were so used to inequality that equality seemed to them uncomfortable. And that's their problem but it's not inherent in the word. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we all know the word misogynistic, men who, who don't like women. And then if you ask a lot of the women, what's the other way around? Women who hate men, they're sort of scratching their heads, aren't they? Because we don't use it so often because perhaps it isn't so common. Misandrous, by the way, if you were wondering. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Misogynistic, it's interesting. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's something there. So, um, you have also talked in your book about how um, laughing our way to the revolution uh, is important. And you talk about how laughter is the only emotion that can't be compelled. Um, mm -hmm. Free emotion, it has no tactical purpose. It's the most contagious of all um, emotions. And um, 
you know, you went on to give a series of quotes about feminism. And uh, so a, a question here, because, you know, sometimes people say humor is a bit of an underrated tool in feminism. And so there's a question here um, from um, Haley, which is, do you think anger is the biggest driving factor for an activist movement or can joy and happiness, especially in being and protesting together, be an important part of a movement? So that's the question. And I prefaced it with your comments about <laughs> laughter. There you go. No, absolutely. I mean, it, it depends on the situation we are in. Sometimes anger is the energy cell and sometimes uh, shared uh, joy and laughter and shared experience is the energy cell. It just depends on the situation. But I do think that laughter is an underrated <laughs> emotion because it is the only one that can't be compelled and it's proof of freedom. And here are Native American cultures. <clears throat> I'm so sorry that I'm hoarse today, sorry. Uh, our Native American cultures have uh, often have a figure who is the spirit of laughter and the spirit of freedom. So it's, it's not a bad uh, guide to say, okay, I'm never going any place where they don't let me laugh, including church, I must say. <laughs> because laughter is the only emotion you can't compel and it is a, a deep proof of freedom. Mm. I mean, I loved the other Native American saying that you quoted in your book, which is um, tell somebody a fact and they'll forget it, tell them a story and they'll mm -hmm. remember it. Right. Um, how true that is. Is that something that's governed the way that you have, you know, made your, your public speaking role and trying to convey your message and the importance of your work? Have you often resorted to stories yourself? Yes, I, I do. Uh because I think generalities are very important, but the way we get to them is usually a narrative story. So um, I, I have always tried to do that uh, in speeches. Um, and uh, especially, I've always tried to leave a lot of time after speeches for whoever is in the room to tell their stories to just get up and if you just trust an audience, um, the audience will take over and become amazingly wise. And you know, before, even now, after all these years, when I'm someplace, of course, now we're not in a lecture situation because of COVID, but when I am about to give a lecture, um, the person in charge will say, well, we, we should have written questions because otherwise the someone in the audience, people in the audience will get up and just go on forever. And I always say, no, you know, not, let's not have written questions because unless you see the person who's asking the question, you don't know, you know much less. And also if someone gets up in the audience and takes over and gives a speech, somebody else in the audience will say, sit down. <laughs> so... You just have to trust the audience. And I love that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I started out uh, doing that because I was uh, afraid to, you know, to speak. I wasn't comfortable speaking. But from that, I learned that how smart audiences are. Mm, lovely. Um, question here from Helen Harstein and also from Sibila. And they both ask about, what do you think about the portrayal of you, yourself, and the women's movement in the TV series, Mrs. America? Um, you might have to just give a quick thumbnail sketch to those of people who've not seen the TV series, Mrs. America. Mm. Well, um, I actually didn't watch it because it was, uh, I, uh, the, the, the two, the two showrunners, who were doing it uh, got in touch with me and Ellie Smeal, who's a very important woman who was uh, head of now and you know many organizations be beforehand. And the script was so inaccurate and crazy that uh, we kind of gave up. I mean, they just, you know, so I actually didn't watch it. 
All right, well, there you are. So we wouldn't know. But then the, the uh, supplementary question from Sibylla is, how do you feel women are portrayed on screen? Do you think that there's been an improvement? So big question there. And, no, well, there, there, there has been a lot of imp improvement because there have been more women creating the movies that are on screen, writing the scripts and being the director uh, and having a, a power to create characters who are whole people, not just the girlfriend of the leading man. Um, and uh, women of, of all different ages, but, but I would say that's still just in the beginning stages of showing women on screen in all of our diversity. Mm. There's still a lot of um, emphasis on the way women look and the kind of, you know, the sexualized poses and, and so on. That, that, that still hasn't changed. It's got better, hasn't it? Yes, no, there, there are occasionally good examples, but it hasn't really changed fundamentally yet. Yeah. And I mean, even for women in public life, actually, again, going back to the Finnish Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, who is only 34 years of age and was severely criticised by some women when she uh, took part in a photo shoot and, and was judged to have been wearing clothes which were not fitting the office and revealing a bit too much cleavage, for instance. And, um, you know, we've had various women politicians um, over the years here in the United Kingdom, you know, British Prime Minister at the time, Theresa May, and so on. There's still a lot of talk about women and their appearance, even when they're in positions of power still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's as if there's no right way to dress because there's no model of women in power. So I just, I think we have to allow women in power to dress in whatever way they are comfortable. Um, we have, of course, a variety of choices. Men have a uniform, yeah. you know, with this ridiculous tie and so on. So, so I hope that they free themselves from their uniform too. Yeah. So we've got um, still more time to uh, just, I uh, know you've talked about a bit about America and how you hope that Kamala Harris is going to have a transformative impact. But going back to the political landscape in the United States, Anne Leopold from Germany says, all the best from Germany. And her question is, what do you think will happen in the Supreme Court now that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is no longer with us? And of course, uh, the late Ruth Bader, RBG, as she was known, was a great champion of uh, equality, mm -hmm. its manifestations. So that's one Trump legacy that is there. Um, Joe Biden has kept quiet about whether he may expand the numbers of the Supreme Court, because there's now a very strong inbuilt um, conservative bias, I think it's 63. So what do you think will happen with the Supreme Court is the question. Well, I, I don't know, but I do hope that the numbers are increased because uh, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg was replaced by a woman who is not only very conservative, but is not qualified, you know, really has had very little experience. And Trump just uh, picked her <laughs> because you know, she was one of the few women who sort of agreed with his politics. So I hope one of two things happens. Either we expand the numbers of the Supreme Court so it can be more representative, or we say to ourselves as, as women, as we have said in the past, the Supreme Court has no right to, di to dictate to our lives, and we are going to act regardless of what the Supreme Court says. Right. A couple of questions related here, so I'll take them together and I'll preface it with uh, something that you have also said. You said that too often we celebrated progress and not understood the dangers of an earlier majority becoming a minority. Um, I slightly, you know, put that in the context of this question. It's not exactly that men are, no, are going to become a minority, but certainly the, 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 the rights of a majority are being challenged. And so a question here from Rosa is, what is Gloria's view of International Men's Day? And if celebrating this day is necessary, is that going to assuage, do you think, any ruffled male feathers? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't personally know anyone who is celebrating International Men's Day. Uh, it's sort of like celebrating International White People's Day. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you know, it might it might have some virtue. You could, I can imagine, uh, phrasing it, you, you know, in a way that would that would be positive. But I haven't. Uh, I don't actually know anyone who is supporting this day. Right. And then Jessica Sandbrook, a sort of similar question on, on men. It's what are your views on men's rights groups set up in a response to the feminist movement? Well, the, the ones that I have experienced uh, have been quite hostile to, to women's equality. Uh, I understand that there have been uh, some legitimate concerns about fathers' rights, about their ability to see their children, love their children, and certainly they should have that right as long as there is no abuse involved. So there is some reason for, for those groups uh, when it has to do with parental rights. But uh, other than that, I haven't seen that, that there is a, a righteous ground for the groups. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, the, the men fighting for access to their children and so on is something, I mean, that celebrities like Bob Geldof have been very active in that particular movement, for instance. All right, got a question here from Penny, which is, which feminists do you look up to? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> who are the icons of the icon <laughs> no well I, there's so many I mean Alice Walker for instance I mean you know is um, does in depth <laughs> what others of us are trying to do in width and she is very important Wilma Mankiller who is the chief of the Cherokee Nation who's no longer with us is someone from whom I learned uh, and continue to learn, really, because she came from a culture that had been uh, matrilineal and egalitarian before uh, the invasion of, 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 of patriarchal and monotheistic Europeans in this country. So um, it was interesting to be with someone uh, who, who's, who, who was trying to restore what once had been. You know, so she kind of gave me faith that it could be in the future. So b both of them have been very important. Uh, Florence Kennedy, who is no longer with us, but was my, uh, one of my speaking partners, was t wonderfully instructive because she was so free to be outrageous. <laughs> And um, uh, to to just break social norms. So no, I'm I'm lear constantly learning. Lovely. And oh, look, another seven-year-old, way past your bedtime, Rosie. Her mother, <laughs> Samantha Martin, says hi, Gloria. My daughter, Rosie, seven, not wanting to be outdone by Florence. Just putting that out there. Also wants to ask you a question, and she says. What made you not give up fighting for women's rights? Uh, the company of people like you. <laughs> I mean, uh, we are, we are uh, social creatures. We, uh, you know, uh, isolation is the, the biggest punishment in the world for a reason, because we are social creatures. And what keeps us going is the companionship of other women and men, or girls and boys, who care about equality and who are friends and who we can turn to and work with together. We need that community. That actually answers partly a question from Kathy Glass, who says, how can mothers of sons help them grow up as feminists? Well, look, speaking as a mother of four children, two sons and two daughters, I'd love to grab my sons to bring them in to hear what you're going to say, Gloria, but they're not. Well, I, would love, I would love to hear your sons. We have to, yeah. right? <laughs> I've done my best with them, I tell you, and with my, with my supporting extras, my girls. We're trying to bring them up in the right way. Yes, brought them up in the right way. So 
Uh, you've already said boys and girls, but so what's your advice to Cathy Glass, mothers of sons, to grow up as feminists? Uh, well, one question is what they are seeing at home. You know, are they seeing fathers who are as active in nurturing and caring for children as, as women are? And are they seeing women who are as uh, active in the world outside the home as fathers are? Because, you know, what we see as children it influences us in a very deep way. So just a couple more questions, because uh, you've been like, you know, kind of static target with all these questions coming. But it's just a reflection of how much people want to talk to you. Um, then this one, look, Nadia Powell is saying, if you can make three wishes for women of the future, what would they be? Thank you, much love and respect, X, 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 <laughs> so, I think if you want to think about the three wishes for women of the future, have you got them? <laughs> or not? Uh, well, I, I guess I would say that I wish that women of the future can state their own wishes and see them come true. I can't know what those wishes are, but I support them. Right. And um, another question here, because we're talking about unfinished business, the fight for women's rights, which is the whole background of this exhibition by the British Library. So this is quite a fitting question, therefore, from Penny. What do you think is the most pressing issue in feminism today? You know, I, I don't think I can say that because it depends what is pressing in the life of the women who are listening right now. Um, it, it, there are all kinds of obvious general issues. If we just got equal pay for equal work, it would transform the economy and redistribute wealth. Uh, if we saw women in positions of elected authority in the same numbers as men, it would change our, our parliament or our Congress. Um, it, it, it just has to do with um, equal representation of men and women in, for caregiving in the home, for decision making in the, in the nation, uh, from, from the home to the uh, tops of our decision making globally, we should be equally represented as we are in the human race. And uh, Maura, Maura Malloy says, this is not a question, just a thank you to you, Gloria. She says, Ireland has made great progress over the last two decades, especially with the abortion referendum. Since the 1970s, you, Gloria, have inspired me and many other feminists to stay in the fight. She says, thank you. And I'm sure actually um, that must, um, really represent the huge body of um, opinion in this audience that's been listening to you to this evening, um, Gloria, our evening here in the UK. I, but it means a lot that that woman who said that comes from Ireland because I have such, I mean, I have occasionally visited Ireland and certainly, uh, you know, we've, we've been in touch uh, about issues and it just is so courageous in a country with such a um, religious tradition, sometimes to the contrary, that Irish women have been uh, brave and uh, just very humane and humorous <laughs> in, uh, in their uh, move forward. That's, it's, Women in Ireland have been an inspiration. Well, but Gloria, you, you really are an inspiration. I mean, you know, from that time in Manhattan when you were your first time on a picket line outside a Manhattan um, supermarket asking people to refuse to buy grapes that had been picked in poverty, um, you know, the anti-Vietnam demonstrations and all the work you've done um, for women's rights. Really, you are the inspiration. And uh, 
your book, which I've, I've been referring to, I just want to give a quote at the end from one of your male friends, uh, because that's the aim of this book of yours, which is you want people to find encouragement and company in this lifetime collection of quotes from your speeches, articles and books, plus some from your friends. And you, you end your book with a quote from a male friend of yours, Franklin Thomas. So I just give part of it and you say, one day our descendants will think it's incredible that we paid so much attention to things like the amount of melanin in our skin or the shape of our eyes or our gender instead of the unique identities of each of us as complex human beings. I wonder when that unfinished business might bring that day when we will think it's incredible that we have thought these things make a difference. Mm. Well, I think we're we're getting there. Uh, I mean, because I hope we are past the point when we can look at a group of um, white people in a multi racial and multicultural country and think that that's a democratic representation. We don't, we don't think that anymore, right? And we, we also don't think that uh, groups exclusively of men make sense. So we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting to that place that Frank uh, so well uh, painted for us. And somebody's asking here, final point, which of your books or any feminist book would you recommend to read? I mean, as I said, you've written so many yourself, but uh, I, I suggest this one actually, because there's a lot of, a lot of truth in these uh, quotes that you've come up with, but is there something you want to orientate people towards, look, going to the library, British library or other libraries to get? Uh, well, I, I, I trust the instincts of the reader to find, you know, what what it is that they need. This this book uh, is interesting, just fun, I think, and hopefully enlightening to start with, because I think quotes are the poetry of everyday life. And if you if if there's a good quote that you if it's good, if you poured water on it, it would become a novel, <laughs> because <laughs> it's sort of it is a seed of a plant. Uh, so um, I, I guess for the moment, I would recommend this one. Okay, Gloria Steinem, a seed of a plant. You have seeded many plants throughout your long and illustrious career that, you know, we've got forests galore as a result of your work. Thank you so much indeed. I have found it fascinating and a great privilege and honor to have conducted this in conversation with you. I'm sure that your words would have inspired many of us. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, don't forget you can buy um, some of Gloria's books. If you just go to the tab at the top of uh, your screen, you'll also find a feedback form. The British Library have told me to remind you that they have many more online events for unfinished business, the fight for uh, women's rights and other programs also. And as Polly said at the beginning, there's an exclusive evening with um, Dolly Parton next week. Just look at the website for that. And Gloria, since we're talking about quotes, I will end this conversation with one of my favorite quotes from Dolly Parton with the amazing hair and the clothes and the boots and the makeup and the nails. And she says, you've no idea how much it costs to look this cheap, is what <laughs> she says. <laughs> there we go. So that- she is, she, is, she is wonderful, Dolly Parton. I mean, she has such a great spirit uh, and it's very clear that she stands for the right of female human beings to be whoever the hell we want to be, right? <laughs> so I'm grateful to her, right? Thank you so much indeed, Gloria. And I hope next time we meet, it will be in person again because it's been wonderful. I hope so. I'm hoping for a third time. And I, I thank you. I thank, thank you so you much. Thank you so much. And um, all the best to you and goodbye from everybody on this event. And thank you to all of you listening to me, Zainab Badawi, in conversation with Gloria Steinem, as well as all your questions, which have been fabulous coming in. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.